It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! Trying to adjust my volume as I'm doing this. Uh, this week's starring special guest star, Miss Robin Frederick. Yeah! And it's the pre road rally edition. Oh, pre road rally, yes. We are special edition. Yes, <laughs> um, thank you, Robin, because I Robin puts like countless hours into her um, presentation that she does every year in the ballroom. So I appreciate you dragging your butt over you here. You bet, you bet. I'm looking days. forward to it. I got a really fun presentation with lots and lots of video excerpts from shows and commercials and. And you're doing stuff. something different this year. You're you're presenting stuff that you know showing how to write for radio and records versus film and TV right. and, and contrast. Right. Radio is quite a different market from yeah. film and television, different kinds of songs. But there's really there are really interesting trends where we're seeing some crossover too. So yeah. uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I'll play both radio style and film and television style and show you how they're different and show you how some ways that they cross over. And, and you can take advantage of that depending on which market you want to hit up. Do you find the crossover stuff is generally from big, big artists, um, and so they wanted them in the movie, and even though the song may not have been perfect, they edited it to make it perfect because they wanted that artist in the oh, movie? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Actually, it's television that's oh. starting to use an, uh, more uh, some, some hit-style songs in really interesting ways, and the shows that are doing it are Nashville and Empire. How many of you watch Empire? <laughs> I mean, I am to I'm totally hooked on Empire, and the songs are incredible, and those are all written for the show uh, every week, uh, um, four or five original songs. It's amazing what Empire is doing. So I'm watching that to see if that's a trend, because it's a huge hit show. We've had listings for Empire. Oh, have you? Yeah. Wow. We have. All right. Um, and Nashville, I know we've had listings for them. We have, and I think we just recently had a member get something in Empire. <gasps> yeah. 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 It's so wonderful. Stuff so, is happening. Yeah, anyway. lots, lots of stuff's going on. All kinds of exciting stuff. Um, welcome. I uh, just opened up the chat room. Hello, everybody. Welcome, chatters. Um, oh, I see Mojo in there. Mojo, I, I keep meaning to email you. I need you. <laughs> it's a personal conversation in front of everybody, but I need you uh, in the ballroom during the collaboration nation thing because there are a couple questions that if the audience doesn't ask them um, you're a smart guy you ask great questions so if I'm getting dud questions from the audience I may find you in the audience so please be in the ballroom for that one <laughs> because yeah just be there anyway I hope you guys are all coming to the road rally it is going to kick serious butt this year um, we have worked unbelievably hard to put together a great 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 convention this year uh, so many great classes uh, the film and TV mentor list for people that oh, want to do wonderful. one to ones it, it, it's like you know well, it's hard to get perspective here, but it's like eight or nine inches in a 12-point font. So we've got more film and TV mentors than ever before. We've got um, people that own production music libraries doing the one-to-one -one, uh, mentor thing and doing yeah. the mentor lunches. Um, we're sold out on the mentor lunches for Friday. Um, Saturday, I think Henry said we've got 13 or 17 seats left, so we're just leaving that link live for a little while longer. It is coming together, um, and it's just a few days away. Yay. I always look forward to the end of it. Big smile on my face and a little peace and quiet in my life. And I get to see my family again. So, anyway, today we are listening to songs that you guys sent in that are um, things that you want to know. Uh, is this workable? <clears throat> Excuse me. Is this good for film and TV? And Robin is going to listen, and she's going to comment, and I'm probably going to nod off because I haven't had a, a day off since Labor Day, break out the violin. Yeah, the and rally's in less than four days. Thursday. Yeah. This Thursday, yeah. Was I here like 12 hours on Saturday? Yes. Was I here yeah, six sure. or eight hours yesterday? Yes. Um, okay, well, you sleep unless I, wait, unless I shake you and <laughs> go, Michael, what should they do? your shoulder. Yeah. You'll know what's what's your it's engineering there. advice here? And you go, what? Right, there you go. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to listen to is called Perfect, Perfect with, with you. you. And thank you guys for submitting this, and thank you for submitting the lyric sheets. I walk up the door, and I 
sniff through the cracks I trip on my tongue when I ought to relax I never seem to fit in anywhere I try And maybe I never will But when you're by my side There's a blue leaf going away Listen to the day And everything is alright When I'm with you I wanna stay, cause all I see is the light. I don't know what it makes me do all of the crazy things I do. Maybe I change if I knew, but there's no reason to. Cause baby, I feel perfect with you. strength to admit when I'm wrong and you give me a voice when I can't sing my song and when I get weary from living in my skin all I need is another chance to see you smile again and there's a cool breeze blowing away the sins of the day and everything feels alright when I'm with you All right. Yeah, I'm going to, I will probably ask Michael to stop them early so that I, we have more time to talk about them, especially once I hear what I want to talk to you about. Um, really, really cute, upbeat, sweet energy in the track. The bouncy piano really launches this song right into a happy kind of, the kind of scene you can see where it's a cute meet, you know, a boy and girl. Uh, or a first date, or a, you know, there's lots of things you could do with this song. In terms of the energy of the track, which is really telegraphing uh, what the song, the lyrics and the melody need to say. When you have a track this strong, and a vocal this strong too, by the way, really, really strong vocal. Love it when you jump up into the head voice on the chorus, it really lifts the song, a beautiful transition there. The melody is working great all the way through for the style of the song that it wants to be. So when you're working for film and television, you want to be sure that your song is focused on a single emotional feel and a, and a, and a single moment, and which this one kind of does in the lyrics, but I want to talk about the lyrics a little bit. Because everything else is pointing in a single direction and it's creating this mood that's fun, upbeat, and it tells you just what kind of scene it should be used in. The problem here for a music supervisor is going to be that the lyrics have a split focus and it's split in more than two directions. It's almost two songs. So we've got a nice opening. I, I walk out the door and I slip through the cracks. I trip on my tongue when I ought to relax. Beautiful opening two lines. Clever, rhyming, fresh rhymes, good images. It right away introduces you to the singer. Okay, I never seem to fit in anywhere I try, and maybe I never will, but when you're by my side, whoa, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where, where did that come from? So we're having fun. You set out to write a song about meeting someone who helps you be the person that you want to be, or when you're with them, nothing goes wrong, or you feel totally confident and all the cares slip away. That was the song you set out to write, but... That's not the song you actually started to write. The first three or four lines of the verse are all about me. And then only the last line, second half of the last line, is about, oh, but by the way, there's this other person in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I would suggest doing is moving, and this happens a lot to all of us, move that verse to the second verse. And in the first verse, 
You just want to spend the first line saying, I just didn't know what to do with myself. I was all thumbs. And then there's this person who came along who, who made sure that I had all my fingers and toes and everything was working. And whatever you want to do. It was an obstetrician. With your cute, fun, <laughs> upbeat lyric, you want to be sure that you quickly introduce the situation and the other person so that when you get to, because you don't have a pre-chorus here, which is fine because it's a long chorus. Um, but when you get to that last verse, but when you're by my side, who? So the problem is the listener doesn't know who you're talking about at that point, And they need to know who you're talking about because the chorus is about what that person does for you. So you can't get to the chorus before you've told the listener, here's what the situation is. And it makes me feel like this. And that's the chorus. So if you don't know what the situation is, the listener's not with you yet, then the chorus doesn't mean much to them. And that's the crucial part of writing a song that works for listeners. always Once you do your first draft, instead of working on your rhymes and stuff and really drilling down into clever language, once you write your first draft, I recommend that you sit down and look at it and say, now what does the listener need to know that I haven't told them? Right. And when do they need to know it? So in the first verse, you say, what question am I answering that the listener might have? And the very first question listeners have is, why are you singing this song? <laughs> you know, what are you saying? Who are, who are you talking about? Why are you singing this song? And, and so you need to let them in, invite them in to the singer's situation right away. Okay, so that's something I noticed right away that when you're by my side, totally threw me, came out of left field. And a music supervisor will have the same reaction to that. They will. I've got to interject and I yes, hate to break do. your rhythm, but no music supervisor I've ever met could give such a thorough analysis as Robin just gave. And they're not going to sit there and go through this whole long mental, no. um, you know, they'll just figure, feel right. They, they'll, they'll know instinctively yeah. in a matter of 30 seconds or less, it's not working for me. Which we so, do also. Yes. Which but we do Robin also. is helping you yeah. get past that 30 seconds. Yeah. And that's what I do too. As I listen to the song, I go, where did it drop me out? Where yeah. did I make, where did I get a, a pullback on it? And you physically can pull back mm -hmm. from it. And then and you go, oh, that's that spot right there. And you circle it and then you go on. Then it's easy to figure out why. So one of my things that I recommend to people when you're writing your song is finish the first draft or first verse and chorus, whatever, and then walk away and take a break and forget what you wrote. And you then come even, back and listen to it, rec record it, and then come back and listen to the recording see, uh, like a listener will. Show the lyrics to, uh, you know, even though I don't recommend yeah. friends and family members, but take a lyric and show it to them and say, what is this about? Yeah, the problem and, is they know you and they know what happened to you, you know, and they know how you feel about that girl. And that's the reason that friends and, and family, family are so work. good. Okay, yeah. walk up to a total stranger. stranger. But somebody, yeah. you know, if you can look at a lyric and go, I understand this, you've got something. Yeah. And if they can't. You probably don't. So the next thing that happens is the chorus happens, and the same thing. Well, there's a cool breeze blowing away. She's gone again. I mean, the other person's gone again. So, well, you're a cool breeze blowing away. Might work better as the opening line of your chorus. You're a cool breeze blowing away the sins of the day. Well, we haven't had any sins yet, so I'm not too sure about the word sins, because it's kind of dark. Um, and everything feels all right. When I'm with you, I want to stay. By the time we get to... Well, everything feels okay when I'm with you, I want to stay. We should know why. And we don't, at this point, really have the feeling of why. We've kind of been told, but when you're by my side, everything's all right. That's not enough. Mm -hmm. You can't just tell listeners, you know this. Mm -hmm. You can't just tell listeners. Only because I know you. <laughs> <laughs> but you have, to sh you have to make them feel it. And this is going to come up a few times uh, in the next songs. You have to make them feel it by putting in the physical sensation, writing the physical sensation that you're talking about so they can feel it too. So you're a cool breeze blowing my way, blowing, you're a cool breeze blowing away. That makes me feel who that other person is. Yeah, cool breeze does relax me and it does make me feel good. Good, I got it. But then you lose it again by just making the statement and everything feels all right when I'm with you, I want to stay. It's Statements don't convince listeners. Images, physical sensations, and action words draw listeners into the song and make them feel what you're feeling. Say that one more time. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Making it's statements like... doesn't convince listeners yeah. of what you're singing. And that is a big issue for all of us. You can make a statement. You can be conversational. But you have to absolutely make sure that before you do that, you've given the listener something that makes them feel it. Physically feel that emotion. We call them feelings because we feel them, yeah? 
make them feel that feeling by either describing the physical sensation of falling in love or falling out of love or being angry. And that means writing the dizziness, the falling, the soaring, the red hot anger, the, all those things that we use. There's real reasons why we do that. So this song, it seems to be teetering between lyrically. There's a lot that's positive here in the track and in the melody and the vocal, but treat, it, it's lyrically, it, it needs another pretty stiff rewrite on it to make it work for film and television. So what I would suggest is that you find a scene from a movie or a TV show about with it has a two young lovers bouncing through the park or going out on a first date, turn the sound down and write the song that would work underneath that scene to create the mood that is going on in that scene. But the mood and the emotion, underlying emotion, not describe what, you know, we walk through the park holding hands because the scene shows them walking through a park. Yeah. That's too on the Now, nose. he didn't do, yes, you're right, and he didn't do that here. Uh, uh, you give me the strength to admit when I'm wrong. I mean, these are all statements about his, an emotional situation, which I'm is the sorry. right way to do it. This guy probably asks for directions, too. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying it's God. <laughs> Possibly. Um, however. Um, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> off. Possibly. Uh, <laughs> This, the one th other thing I want to point out, though, and, and this is where what happened to a lot of us, which is we write two songs at once, um, because once you turn your inspiration on, there's it's not linear. Your inspiration can, can be writing two or three songs at once. And I see a second song here in the chorus. Well, there's a cool breeze blowing away the sins of the day, and everything feels all right when I'm with you. I want to stay, because all I see is the light. Okay, she, she, there should be more mention of you in there, for one thing. You, you are person. the light. You are the light. You, I see you, I see the light. When okay. I see you, I see the light. Uh, something, in other words, what is she? What is she doing who, to make him feel this way? The second half of the chorus, I don't know what makes me do all of the crazy things I do. Maybe I'd change if I knew, but there's no reason to. This is a different song. I don't know what makes me do all the crazy things I do. What crazy things? And so is that walking in the door and slipping through the cracks or tripping on my tongue when I ought to relax? I don't know that I call those crazy things. Those are kind of embarrassing things. And he wants to not do those. And when she's around, he apparently doesn't do them. So I think you have two really strong ideas here. And I would try to separate out the one that says, hey, I'm such a geek, um, but I'm... Uh, but I'm going to, I, pro, I, I keep telling myself every day that I'll wake up and, and I'll be different. If it's about someone else who helps you be different and helps you lose that geekiness and that awkwardness, then we need to know that right from the beginning of the song. And be sure not to get lost in rhyming. Nobody ever said, gee, I've got to hear that song again. I love those rhymes. It just doesn't happen. You want people to want to, people want to hear your song again because it makes them feel good or feel sad or feel the way they felt once a long time ago and they are revisiting that. Um, so rhymes are not so important as making the kind of emotional sense that draws listeners into the song and gets them involved. And those are the kind of songs that work with scenes. I guess that's what they need them to do. A question about the melody and the rhythm. I want to address that for a minute. Uh -huh. um, it's very bouncy. It's very fun. It's very lighthearted. It is engaging on that mm -hmm. level. But it sounded dated to me almost like back to the, a Three's Company theme song. Oh, yeah. Uh, from that yeah. era. But I also realized that there could be a modern sitcom that could use that. You know, forget the lyrics for a moment mm -hmm. and just think about the track. Um, it could almost juxtapose against something. If you want to be a little dated for the juxtaposition and going for the, it's corny and kitschy factor. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. is there a way to take that kitschiness and come up with just, uh, going back to what you're saying about the lyrics now, just take a simple idea. Because if you're going to do a theme song, you've probably got under a minute that it's going to play. You're not going to get You got pulsed. 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah it, that's at, at most. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, well, no, you have to write from the first notes. You have to establish the feel of the show from the very first note you hit. And what I think you're responding to here is the piano yeah. uh, playing the straight eights. 
And what you can do to give this a more contemporary sound is take that piano and either effect it or change it to a different sound. I would but definitely be lightening that piano sound, by the way. I noticed that, yeah. I would definitely go towards, you could try a tack piano, you know, a, a much more um, a edgy piano on that thing. Uh, and then I would bring in a different kind of drum. I would put drums in it, maybe a loop, because the percussion that we have now, I'd have to go back and listen again to see what the, if there's percussion in there or what it's doing. Um, but you could try putting in a loop, an interesting uh, loop to create uh, some, some percussion sounds that aren't obvious drum sounds and use that uh, maybe some ticky tacky things. Uh, you could even try creating some sounds yourself and then dropping those into a MIDI loop. Anything that changes the sound, because I think the underlying arrangement is good. Mm -hmm. It's the sounds that are pulling its backwards. It almost feels like it could work with a hip hop. Uh, you probably could, yeah. You could go longer. through hip hop loops and see what you yeah. can find and just play them along with what you've got and see what happens. And you can keep it in the background or you could try uh, bringing just one sound out into the foreground on the two and four. But it is, it's pulling back towards uh, um, a Welcome Back Cotter thing. We had a, a listing for 70s or 80s sounding theme so songs. They, they were going to be source music in the TV show. Maybe this was written for that. Yeah, it might have been because yeah. it would be perfect for that. If mm -hmm. that played in the background of somebody's living room while the actors were close to the camera yeah. on a two-shot having yeah. dialogue, you would absolutely believe that that was the theme song for a sitcom from a couple decades ago. Yeah. I think there's a, a lot, a lot of really good raw material here. Um, and I think that fixing up the co the track, the production, um, is just a question of going through your library and finding some sounds. And you know what? Look for reference tracks. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Look at what's being used. Uh, Brett Denon's um, Comeback Kid was used as the theme song for All About a Boy. Um, that's a pretty good one to look at. Take a look at some of the themes for current sitcoms, grandfathered, a um, couple others that are just coming out that have to do with music. And, and look at, this, at the sounds and see if just tweak, tweaking the sounds here might give you a more contemporary and adding some things to it that create a more interesting percussive quality to it um, might really... Uh, do it because I don't think the voice, I don't think the vocal has to change. I think the vocal's quite I, good. I like the singer. Yeah. All right, All let's right. move on. Um, can we go to the hard rock one? Uh, you want to go st jump there? Okay. Yeah, just because this one was light and that one's a whole different can of worms or kettle of Actually, fish. Actually, yeah, that's um, sure. Let's do that or two, the next three, one's a very different too. Five. So, so number five, I believe. Yeah, it number was. five, got it. Okay, and this one is called Waiting on Myself. I know, but I don't know, but it is. Yeah, that sounds like stage yeah, he's, yeah, Rick Springfield no, but it's there. It's there. Who is it? Who is this? <laughs> okay, I got it. Focus.
Well done. <laughs> yeah. Really well done. Yeah. Strong so, singer. Really good, strong singer. I Man, am. That guy's good. Very derivative of Dave, Dave Grohl. I mean, I instantly heard it, but there is something that Robin kept going, what does this sound oh, like? It reminds me of the 80s, and yeah. I'm seeing a lot of people saying that, too. And there was a song called Urgent, Urgent, Emergency. Who was that? Does anybody Foreigner. remember? Was that Foreigner? Was it Foreigner? Was it, uh, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, it was a big hit. Um... Uh, the the vocal texturing and the guitar riff and the yeah it's it's really well done and powerful and tight the playing is really tight mm -hmm. and the energy is there there's uses for a song that recalls the 80s like that um, for sure I mean when they have a there are a number of shows I didn't bring a list I'm gonna actually do it at the rally of uh, shows right now like playing house that are taking place in the 60s 70s and 80s and they're uh, using music like this right there in the, yeah, Foreigner, is that what we're saying? Um, and they're using uh, songs from the period to set the scene and in, in set the, the era. They're using hits, known songs, in, but not all the time. And so it's really interesting to listen, to watch these shows. You would be shocked, shocked if you saw the emails that I get, the number of taxi members per week that with music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that are getting placed in TV shows, it's happening on a multi-time a week basis. There's a lot now. more shows now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, we have a, a company that we work with. Don't type it in there if you know who it is, but they've been awesome um, in letting us know every placement they get. Oh, good. And, and they're one of the few that does. And clearly, that market is there. So yeah. if you've got and old it's demos. Old demos that were done on a TAC 4 track, or you did a 16 track back in the early 70s, thought you were going to get a record deal, you didn't, but you own the master and you own the copyright, you need to be pitching that stuff. This is beautifully, you got clean and punchy, it's a great mix. I don't think this is a period uh, recording, I think this is a new right. recording, but boy, they sure nailed the period. Um, and it's really strong. There's Here's the things I would be looking at. Um, as far as going forward with your songwriting, um, I don't know that you want to change this one because the vocal is so good and the track is so good. It could be used in, a, in an 80s situation um, to replace a rock song that they couldn't get, something like that. Um, but here's one of the things that's happening. Lyrically, it, it's not um, making sense. It's very abstract. You know what you're singing about. But it's an abstract idea, waiting on myself. I get what that phrase could mean, but then the song doesn't seem to really ever sit down and really nail it for the listener. Um, if it's another place I've gone, that's the opening line. If it's another place I've gone, it's, this is already too confusing. You're in another place, then what place? Then it's another way I'm wrong, and it's another way to fall. It's just, it has beautiful, kind of non, almost a nonsense uh, syllable feel to it. It just waterfalls over you really well. And so you almost don't notice. But one of the th great things I saw David Grawl mentioned many times here in the, by, in, by the chatters, um, it, I, David Grawl is like the Holy Grail, man. I just think that guy is so good. Uh, and, and the songs are too. So when you really listen to some of those songs, they have tremendous meaning and honesty and authenticity. And when you're singing rock, you have to have that authenticity. Those listeners are really looking for it. And um, they expect you to be one of them and to have something to say to them that they can relate to immediately and stay with you. So here, I see right away another place, another this, another that. And it, I don't know what you're referring to. And so in a sense, the listener is backed away. Um, in pushed outside. Now there are songs, there are bands that do this, like Fall Out Boy and Panic at the Disco and stuff, but they're really dealing in poetic language in general, and the music supports it. They they right. aren't doing straight ahead mainstream rock. Yeah, this is this is abstract. Yeah, 
So set up another burned out cause is a great line. I love that. Set up another burned out cause. I would just start right there. Is this another burned out cause? Is this, you know, will I get another chance at all? Burned out cause tells me right away where the, where the, where the uh, singer is. Is there any chance at all? Is he at the end of his rope? Is there, you know, am I going to be able to get back? Because it's another way to be living at all or forgiven at all. It's a great rhyme in there, living at all and forgiven at all. But again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Listeners are not impressed with rhymes emotionally impressed with rhymes they may be like, oh wow it's cool rhyme but they're not emotionally with you they're mentally with you and you never want them to be mentally engaged but uh because they'll drop out if if what you're doing is just mentally engaging them and not engaging their emotions emotions first i've got a question yes we get listings from music supervisors that need something for a show and it's background source music and so let's say that mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. 1997, a Seattle club. They want something, or whatever Dave Grohl's, or Foo Fighters are more recent than that. Anyway, yeah, it so they want something that sounds like Foo Fighters. And it's a texture. And you and I both know that they're going to have it way down in the mix. And mm -hmm. there's going to be dialogue. But yet the, the supervisors will talk about lyric themes. And I'm thinking, why does it even matter? Because nobody is going to hear the lyric. Um, Sometimes is it possible that the texture and the era and the overall sound, this sounds authentic of Dave Grohl, you know, yeah, uh, well, everybody jumped on that and said, yeah, sounds like Dave Grohl. So if we had a listing for sounds like Dave Grohl and I need it for background source, would this fly or would the supervisor consider the lyric stuff? Because they do ask for lyric here's things. The thing, yeah, you're, you got a good point. Um, it's so good. It's, it's recorded and, so, and performed so well, and I just really want to emphasize that because it's really good, yeah. and I really want to hear you sing a good song over it. And, and the melody's working. The melody's dated uh, also, but it's a good, solid uh, melody. It's the lyrics is where the issues are. So the question is, does that uh, ding the song for a music supervisor looking for something to put in the background of a bar scene, let's say, or a, oh, or um, a... a um, hip nightclub near a major university and it's a bunch of university guys because that's what this would probably be used in. Okay, so let me give you an example and, and that is in the film 21 they used a song by Weezer called Everybody Get Dangerous and it's way in the background of this bar scene and it's before the movie actually gets dangerous and what they're doing is the music editor is brilliant on that film and the music editor is pushing it up in between the dialogue lines, mm -hmm. and you just barely hear it, but what you hear is everybody get dangerous, everybody get it's dangerous, tel telegraphing over and over go. and over, way in the background. And more and more, especially in films, but also in TV, you get these music supervisors, and in that case, I think it was the soup because he's really knowledgeable. Um, you get these supervisors who do their own editing, mm -hmm. or vice versa, and uh, and they're looking to do to get every edge that they can get mm -hmm. to make themselves look good and make the show work on another level so that people who really love the show and are really listening like psych is another t is a tv series where people really examine the music uses and they really hear the little nuances and interesting stuff they're going to want to do that and and there are so many good songs that you're up against that if there's another song that has a chorus that that is more emotionally it has more emotional impact and speaks to the authentic, the authentic feelings of this crowd or of the viewers, then you're going to lose out. No matter how good this song is, you're going to lose out on that. You have to think about the competition and can't say, oh yeah, but it'll just be way in the background and nobody will hear it. You just got an A plus, not that you ever Thank get you. an A minus. But <laughs> no, I love getting it. I was hoping you would say that because that is, we get pissed off letters from members saying, you Excuse me, you wanted Dave Grohl, I sent you Dave Grohl as background right, source. Yes, right. it was, but somebody else probably sent a Dave Grohl sound alike yeah. that was just better because the lyric was better. Yeah. Even though they both sounded yeah. very much in the Dave Grohl ballpark and had the right energy, the right um, tonality, timbre, everything. So there you go. You, you, yeah. you went where I was hoping you'd go. Thank yeah, you. this one, the chorus here, Waiting on Myself, Always Finding nothing's wrong always finding nothing's wrong god that's confusing no more than i can tell what 
Um, <laughs> that's what I mean. This is so good, and you and and this person has so much talent. This band is so good. I would say. Going forward, just study your competition and look at the chorus lyrics and, and come up first with your title and make it a title that speaks for you. Because I'm sure this song speaks for you. This song expresses something you want to say, and that's what's important. But if you're going to take it out into the market, it has to express what listeners need to hear and want to hear and respond to as well. So it's when you take it out into the market, suddenly it adds this whole other dimension. So I can see the authenticity in this, but listeners, as a listener, I can't feel it. And one of the issues right here with that line, always finding nothing's wrong, is always finding nothing's wrong is is too many abstract words in a row. And then no more than I can tell is just filler, I think. So waiting on myself was the idea for the song, but then it's the lyric itself is an abstraction. You have to find real examples of real things in life that mean something to you and to your listeners so that you can put them in your song and make them feel it too. Really interesting song. Great structure, uh, excellent song structure. I think the, the melody is working. Contemporary melodies are a little more twisty than this one is and have a little more forward momentum, but for rock, it works. And um, I'm sorry, but Le Traveler 101 says lay off the LSD when writing lyrics. That yes, sounds like good advice. Yes, <laughs> I learned that years ago. It doesn't work, honest. It, doesn't it work. feels like it in the moment, though, doesn't it? Magic, yeah, that's the problem. Magic Brownies are just funny. Okay, something else you want to go on to? Excellent, yes. beautiful uh, track. Let's beautiful go track. go on to number track. two, which is called Return to oh, Me. Oh, for something completely different. Yes. Okay, Return to Me. Oops, works the, better when I've got the volume up. Number, the number two. Yeah.
Alaska quick fade right there. There you go. Thank you. Well, beautiful intro. Right from the beginning, I, I was really drawn into the mood, uh, the moodiness of it, the mysterious quality, the sensuality of it. Um, and and uh, that was working. You can, by the way, put a lot of space into film and television songs. Um, you can have long breaks in them, not, but this is more space than you can generally get away with. You can have long. You can have an instrumental break between verses, an instrumental break between a verse and a chorus. You can have a long instrumental break after a chorus. Tell them why. Because there's room for dialogue, and the editors will use it. I, um, you can definitely. I was. I'm not going to play it at the rally, but I. I found an example I almost used called um, "Medicine" by uh, an alt band called Daughter, and it's been used in a lot of TV series. And uh, it's just, there's such long, stretched out spaces <laughs> between the lines. But in order to get away with, and they were using it in a, in a scene, they used like three minutes of it, underneath a chase in a forest, in, and then into some dialogue scenes, and then out of those, and into something else. It was just an amazing use. And uh, it's well worth listening to, by the way, and the, the show was called uh, The Blacklist which uses great music. Love that show. Isn't it? And the songs, and the uses of songs are incredible. The watch show the gets Blacklist. better. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you're not watching Blacklist, watch two episodes, learn who the characters are. Uh, great show. Yeah, great show. It, it's actually gotten better than Homeland, which was a yeah, I agree. Show. And it's on, uh, you can find out by going to a website called tunefind.com. You can look up the show, The Blacklist, and you can see all the songs that are used in every episode. And the songs are really eclectic and really interesting. So, this song, I, I kind of expected Lana Del Rey to start singing. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the issues I have with this song, after that gorgeous, in, compelling, beautiful, mysterioso intro, when the vocal came in, the, the singer is doing okay. The singer's okay. And you can get away with a lot when you're putting your, your vocal in reverb, and the reverb here is working well with the voice. But you really kind of, for a song this sparse, with this kind of few lines, you really have to get the idea that the singer is talking to someone. You really, the singer has to act, and you only have very, very few lines. And the fewer lines you have, the better of an actor you have to be. So I wanted to hear Chris Isaac on this, who, by the way, is a really good actor. And, and that kind of voice that just phrases a little bit off and, and maybe scoops a little on one word, and it just adds enough of a nuance that it's much more compelling. Um, if you listen to a song called Promise by Ben Howard, spacey, spacey, and yet the voice compels you to listen. And, and so when you're doing something like this, it's a challenge to the vocalist, even though you might not realize it. So especially if you're going to repeat lyrics lines don't do that you say this this was three six lines short lines followed by i do and then it was repeated that section again i want you i need you i breathe you beautiful lines but unless there's a reason to repeat it there's no reason for the listener to continue to listen um it's it can work I would say write, I think that's what happened, that that got repeated again, that whole section. I would write new lyrics, short lines, that stay really simple like this one. It's hard, this is a real challenge to do. And write those short lines and, and build the song, take this, let the song go forward. I breathe you, then what do I do? And that's the challenge, and it's probably why the writer didn't write the next section, is what do you write after I breathe you? You know, this is beautiful. But you need to write something that's just as strong and moves the song forward. Then um, the electric guitar in the break after the first verse, uh, the, the first ending, and then you repeat the whole section, is way too abrupt and edgy. Just I would take the electric guitar out of this and uh, or or roll off all the the edgy 4K. It, it also just takes you out of the scene. It seems um, to, yeah. Yeah, you know, supervisors like something that carries you through a scene. They really love stuff that will take you through three scenes, but without the music changing. That the music yeah. is the common thread, and that just totally made you go, "What? 
What yeah, happened? it stopped me. Yeah, it yeah. took me right out of the mood when that guitar came in. It comes in later on with the, or as the track continues mm -hmm. to play. Here the track drops out and the electric guitar comes in. So be aware that the track has to, and this what you're pointing out is exactly true. So be aware that the track has to convey the same emotional mood as the singer, the lyric, the melody, the rest of the, everything about it works together to convey the same emotional mood to the listener and get them into that place and then keep them in that place because they rarely change moods drastically and your song is not going to be the thing that goes along with that mood chain they're going to change they're going to take the song out and go to their new scene where it's a different feel and then they'll bring some other song in later on but they rarely if ever uh, change the mood uh, within a scene and keep a song rolling through that so and that's the other thing when I sometimes people will play something for me where the singer and the song is one mood and the track is a different mood so far we haven't heard that mm -hmm. all three these three songs are right but just within the song be sure that you keep that rolling forward um, pitch the vocalist also has some pitch issues pitch for film and television is not such a big deal as it is for radio where absolutely auto-tuned things are almost it also depends on the context the type of music this is yeah. cool trendy yeah. music where people might perceive it that it was yeah. pitchy for a reason you know i mean they could they i'm not could. saying that they will but they could um uh, for this song though because the singer wasn't really committing to the acting mood right I wasn't caught up in it, and when you do that, when you, you what you're saying is exactly right. You, pitch is not always an issue because when you're fully committed to the character of the singer and the acting of the singer, when you're fully committed to that, pitch becomes part of the character. And here, the character of this singer is smooth and cool, and 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 it's an achingly needy song. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And the singer, you, you don't want to distract anyone from that by having the singer be pitchy without being intentional, I would without just it being a part of the character. Use Marvin Gaye, sample Marvin Gaye and lay him <gasps> in on this. Wouldn't it be awesome? <sighs> yes. You know, and sometimes you want to bring in a singer yeah. when you have a song that's this sparse, and ev and it's true of every song, actually. You may need, you may not be the singer for it, and for film and television, since they're going to use it this way, this is not a demo, you may want to bring in a singer that can really bring this song to life. So those are I'm, a few suggestions. I want to make an interesting observation going back to our discussion of the blacklist. I've noticed TV, I think, has gotten better in a lot of regards. Mm, shows like Blacklist, Homeland, there are uh, so many really, really strong shows on television nowadays. And I've noticed that music supervisors working, especially on hour-long dramas, are starting to use music more like cinematic music supervisors use it. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's not the same television music supervision that we saw even three or four years ago. Uh, it, it's morphing and be, oh, yeah. becoming more important. Much more sophisticated. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm noticing more and more. We had 200 and th 239 different TV series, not TV shows, mm -hmm. TV series using songs. And that didn't even include this fall. Wow. This year, we had uh, almost 240 shows so far using songs. And some of them are using one song in a show, like Blacklist, but they're using it just, I mean, just exquisitely. And then there's shows like Awkward, and I mean, it's like carpeted with songs, but it, they're used really well. Chasing Life, great song uses. That's Chris Muller, one of my favorite supervisors. I love the way he uses songs. Um, I forget who's doing the Blacklist. I actually do know. Um, I can't remember. But either. again, it's these things are well worth watching because those are the uses that you want. You don't want to write a song and say, yeah, well, they'll use 10 seconds of my song. I, I made a note. Um, <laughs> give your song more space. You, you said before, songs with more space tend to get longer plays because they will transition across three scenes that tie together, common thread use. And, and Robin was absolutely right. Uh, best example I've ever seen was on an episode of The Newsroom, probably last season, mid-season. And I remember speaking about it on the show before. Um, Frankie Pine is the music soup on that. And I actually called her and said, that was three minutes of the best music supervision I've ever seen or heard in my life. It was a bar scene, a scene on the floor of, of the newsroom, and a scene in the office. And all three scenes really tied back to the same point, which I think was mm. having character mm. or something like that. Yeah. And this song, lyrically, melodically, emotionally, everything about it, 
carried you through all three scenes, and it, it was a work of art. And yes, I, yeah. I just called her and said, Frankie, you're freaking amazing, because <laughs> that, that was the highest form of the art that I'd seen yes. in a very long time. I've said that once. I said that to Chris Molero the first time I talked to him. He used a song that went through three very difficult scenes, mm -hmm. and I, I said, that's incredible what you just did. I mean, they're so thrilled when you notice, because that's their art, and, yeah. they, and they feel deeply about it. They love the songs they use. These songs have to move them first, by the way. Um, it, it, a music supervisor doesn't know if they can use a song that doesn't move them. Yeah. How will they ever know how to use it? They're looking for a song that moves them. Then they'll keep that on their playlist. And then when those scenes come along, they go, oh, yeah, that song, that song. Remember when I said yeah. to Andy Gowan one day from How I Met Your Mother, and I said, oh, I heard this song that you used. I'd never heard of this artist, Keegan DeWitt. And you used this song. And he just lit up and said, I've been trying to use that song for the last year. I've been pushing that song. And they wouldn't put it in, and they wouldn't put it in. And finally he said, I found the exact right scene, and they couldn't say no. And this answers a question we get asked by members all the time, which is, you forwarded my music, and I haven't heard a thing. And then they hear these stories about somebody getting a call years later mm. and that is exactly yes. why yes and they're they may be pushing that song and not getting it in yeah and we just told three stories of talking to music supervisors and in each case the music supervisor goes oh yes i loved that song i wanted to use it so it's common it, it is across the board with all music supervisors this is how they do what they do they love music and they love songs and they and the songs that move them are the ones they don't forget mm -hmm. so this song has the potential to be really a very moving song. I think that it probably does need a different singer, or I would suggest taking some acting classes and working not necessarily on your pitch, work on your acting. That's the interesting thing, because pitch things tend to go away when, when you have the commitment to the acting job. Um, look at the uh, track, and I would say simplify, pull the electric guitar out, and I would say deepen the synth sounds by layering more synths on there as the track progresses. Make the percussion more interesting as the track progresses. I'm not saying do a ton of stuff to it, but just add some extra sounds and loops and, and maybe something, just there are things that are below your hearing level that will add <laughs> things to your track. Oh, I do that all the time. I'm 61. Pretty much everything's oh, below no, no, my no. hearing level. <laughs> Don't admit it, though. Um, I put strings way back there where somebody, somebody, if you told somebody I just added strings, they'd go where? Right. It's you know? visceral. But if you took them out, you'd notice it. Mm -hmm. And add them way up high as the song progresses, which lifts the whole song. There's all kinds of subtle things you can do with production to make this work better for film and television and make a music supervisor fall in love with it and want to use it in two or three scenes because that's where the money is too. That's right. <laughs> Those are the uses you want. Speaking of visceral, back when I did audio post, many of you may not know this, some of you may, um, there's a thing called room tone. Almost every scene has room tone. Back in the day, it was just a loop uh, of an air conditioner in the background. Oh, yes. Every single scene has room tone or if it's outside street tone, whatever. We used to actually pitch the room tone up and down according to if it was a dark, heavy scene, the air conditioner would be oh. at a different note. If it's a lighter scene, pitch it up a little bit. I didn't and know it that. actually changes how you feel about the scene, even though you never even notice it. I, that's perfect. I never yeah. heard that. And it makes perfect sense. It's just like putting in the strings where you can barely hear them. You've got to search for them. But it's a visceral thing. We respond to that. Story. Nugget. Nugget yeah. there. That's like incredible. Anyway. Use that. Use that in your when you do music, use that. Because even if it's subliminal, it's huge difference. Absolutely. Um, let's go to the last one on the list. I'm bouncing around today just because I can. Uh, this one is called Lost Sea. My volume up. I do. <laughs> Oh, 
drops of blood falling down. Get going on this Go. one. Do you watch NCIS? Yes. Okay, when Ziva left and I think maybe went back to Israel or mm -hmm. somewhere and she's on that freighter. Yeah. And she's thinking about Tony and should they have had the relationship or whatever, this would have been great when she was yeah, in that, yeah, yeah. that belly of the beast. Well, show. I want to talk, that's exactly where I want to go is let's, I want to talk about what scene goes with this song. There's so many things about this song that do work from, for film and TV. Mm -hmm. The track is excellent. The vocal is unique and very appealing and really has a ton of character to it that fits what the lyric is talking about. You really get the, I, you believe her. And that's really important, and this is a difficult song to be believable on. Um, the it's got a fresh melody. It's very current. Uh, all, all in all, it's a it's a really really good song, and it's like ninety percent of the way there for film and television. Here's the one spot, and this is really interesting. I'm so glad we got a song like this because this is what I want people to look at: is when you're writing a song for film and TV, one of the first things you want to look at is the chorus. And the chorus has to be able to stand alone behind a scene because often that's the only part that mm -hmm. you'll hear. The beginning, the verse may be underneath dialogue or they might use an instrumental part of the song for underneath the dialogue. And then at the end of the scene, up comes this chorus and it sums up the, the powerful emotion that's in that scene. And this one has got an excellent, I don't want to love you and I don't want you to love me. And of course, you know she does. And, and that's the kind of scene that this would probably be used in. I mean, I, if you can imagine a scene this song would go with, that's the kind of scene it would go with. Or somebody who's so hurt that she's, you get the, I don't want to love you and I don't want you to love me. Because then we'll both sink in the lost sea. Okay, great. It's great up to that point. Great. And this idea of sinking because love is too much or it's too overwhelming or it's too dark or it's too hard. Any of those things. It could be in any of those kinds of scenes. Because we'll both sink in the lost sea, and then comes the last line, and there's only room for me. Oops. What kind of scene can you put that in? That's so abstract, and it's so personal. And you can, this can be a personal song for your own album, but if you want to pitch this to TV, it can't be that personal. And there aren't, there aren't scenes like that. I thought it, I, I took it completely differently. You did? Yeah, I feel like Siskel and Ebert now, but um, I thought it meant that she is so messed up 
Uh -huh. that I don't want you in my world because there's only room for me. Right, but there's and, no scenes for that. That's what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I think for her album, it works fine. It's very personal. And it says, um, and, and exactly, I do. I think that is what it is. Um, it, love is the plague and you've become the enemy. I mean, that's another metaphor, but yeah. it's still the idea is that for whatever reason, my heartbeat sinks with the raindrops, my bare feet touch ground as the wind stops. She's so unique that no one can love her is this is a really mm. unusual theme and it is it does seem to be what the song's about aren't there a lot of messed up characters in movies or tv dramas that are, are you know doomed as far as a relationship yeah but what so scene personal? is there and this is a good question i'm glad yeah. we we're talking about this i've come to the i've come to this over time yeah what scene is there that shows that and in what scene would you say that that's why i brought up the scene about ziva and tony and it, it was only triggered by the reference to the sea because she was on the boat. But she was in that boat leaving America thinking about how she's so screwed up that she's toxic. And she was feeling for Tony. But oh, didn't. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, she didn't want him. So that was the scene that popped into that my head. I, I can't think of others, but that one did. Anyway, I, I don't want to have to arm wrestle you on it. It's just, no, I, uh, that could I, work. I, I think you're have, right. You and I, I think have you're good right. discourse on this. Looking things. at the rest of this, give me love and I'll let it die. Offer your hand and I'll deny. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. It's just me and the sea. I chose the path because the water chose me, which I love that line. Um, Kiss me slowly. I don't want to fall too fast. I'm a captain of a ship that got destroyed along its path. Okay, my heartbeat sinks with the raindrops. My bare feet touch ground as the wind stops and I'm falling down. Not sure how the first two verses feed into that, but I think you have a good point. There, there is a scene like that, and there are characters like that. Um, I think I might have dated some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Been a long time. <laughs> I, I'm not sure the first two, well, if you're going to do that, because the first two verses don't feed into that particularly right. well, so I no, would just say just that section. Does. Yeah, that the the verse do, the chorus does say that, and then it does it comes back to that in the in the in the next verse two section. Give me love and I'll let it die. Offer your hand and I'll deny. Maybe this is another situation where you need to flip the verses. Right. And you can try that by just doing an edit, a digital edit. Just flip the whole thing. The the a whole vocal second part, second of six section of verses and move them up to the top Does and move her, the first to the second position. Her vocal is so contemporary. It's so um, good, yeah. And the overall vibe of the song, I think it would be appealing, which is, you know, it's kind of like being attracted to somebody on a physical level before you get to know them. Yeah. Um, that a music supervisor would hear this. This would be one of the ones that makes it onto the shelf because sooner or later mm -hmm. I'm going to find a spot for that because it, it, it's cool. Yeah, well, and they're going to be looking, though, for a scene that it could work with, and the first place they're going to look is that chorus. So if you don't lead them up to that chorus clearly, right. they're going to go, oh, I can't use that because that, that doesn't make sense. They might never get to, to the chorus. They might not, but it's so, like you were saying, the vocal's so good and the track's so good. Try this, try verse two, give me love and I'll let it die as the opening line of the song. Boom, we know who it is. We know who she is. Mm -hmm. Give me love and I'll let it die. Offer your hand and I'll deny. It's just me and the sea. I chose this path because the water chose me. And we know exactly who she is and what the sea means. And and then the chorus will make sense. I was looking at the first two verses and getting to the chorus and then I couldn't make the last line make sense. I think sense. you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a classic Flip. flip them. And yeah. I do it all the time. I do it in my songs all the time. I don't know what I'm really talking about until I get to the second verse. And I see it all the time out there in my clients and stuff. It's it's common. So one of the first things you do when you're having trouble with a lyric is look to see if you need to rearrange some lines and make sure that your opening line makes the state states what the song is and who or who the person is or where we're going with this song so that the listener is immediately there. Because music supervisors, unlike people who are driving in their cars with the radio on who may not listen to the first verse until they heard the song 20 times, um, music supervisors listen to lyrics really, really hard because those lyrics may be up full. What time are you doing your thing at the rally? Is it 11, 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. I've got to tell you, it's one of the few things I don't need to be in the ballroom for at the road rally, but I'm there um, because I always learn so much from Robin. Um, usually uh, 
Friday is a rough day on all of us on the staff because we've got one-to-one -one mentor things going on in one area. We've got the mentor lunch going on somewhere else. We've got 10 classes going on upstairs, and we've got a big panel in the ballroom. By Friday night, the staff and I are all just zombies. By Saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning, frankly, I'm a mess. I hide it well on stage. But I always stay in the ballroom for your thing. You do. And I don't need to. I mean, I'm not that I know everything in the world, but <laughs> no, I, can, you don't need to. I can call Robin any time and get this advice. I can, you know, reread the book again. But if you are coming to the road rally, be in the ballroom Saturday at 11 o'clock because she will not disappoint you. No, we'll have fun. Yeah. We'll definitely have some fun. Uh, let's good do song. one more. Good song. Uh, really, really good. Tremendous potential. Yeah, just straighten out that lyric and you've got a lot of... I'm sure there are libraries that would love to have that song. Do you have a preference over this one or that one? Uh, number three or number see. four? Oh, I would like to do uh, this one. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I like uh, both of them are very interesting, uh, have interesting issues to look at. Uh, but this one's quite different. All right. And this one is called The River. Right? I yes. got the right one? Mm -hmm. You got the right one. Yes, you do. And I'm on pause. I'll take it back to the top. I believe that the water is fine. Liquid blue with your glory divine. Captivated by the song that you sing with the melody. So ring always. Na na na. 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 Na na Good. 
All right. What okay. say you? Ah, lots of stuff to say about this. Okay, it's got great energy. I love the build. Uh, could definitely work for, especially the end. When we got to the end, that big mm -hmm. tag could definitely work for a high energy scene. Um, it's a great blend of uh, kind of blues, gospel, rock. There's a lot of that around uh, now with uh, um, Hozier and uh, uh, James Bay. It reminds me a little bit of that. And um, uh, so it's right on target for the style that's uh, a very hot style right now, and libraries are certainly looking for it. The character vocal, the, for the vocal has a lot of character in it, and it's really good, and it's right on target uh, for the style of the track. Very, very nice. Um, the horns, I just want to make a quick note so I don't forget. Um, the horns work fine in the breakdown when you have the low horns going, but the horns on the... Um, Right at the end of the first pre-chorus, after the first na na nas, there's a, a very fakey horn riff right there, the very first one that we hear, and that's not good. So I would just take that horn, that very first horn riff out. Uh, you cannot have a fake horn sound, um, especially the first time you hear it. Later on, it sound they sound pretty authentic. It's a good sample, and, um, and during the breakdown, especially the low end. It's funny people in the chat room were talking about that first uh, when they first came in. Woof! It's like woof. Yeah, see, you all noticed it's like, yeah. whoa, stop. And especially because the song itself has so much authenticity and grit in it and organic quality, bluesy quality, and here comes this big fake horn riff. So take that out because right then a music supervisor will turn it off because they cannot use it. And uh, they won't call you and say, please take that riff out. So um, don't uh, watch it. Anytime you're not sure, don't do it. Um, but they work later, so uh, keep them in the, when you, the, the whole gospel-y thing really starts happening uh, halfway through the breakdown, keep that in there. Um, okay, uh, the, this is another one, this is really interesting because I'm seeing this a lot today, these things of flipping the second and first mm -hmm. verse, here we go again. The very first verse, I believe that the water is fine, liquid blue with your glory divine, very poetic. And glory divine sounds a little bit mm, awkward. Captivated is not a very bluesy word uh, by the song that you sing with a melody soaring on wings. The whole thing is way too poetic and Hallmark cardish, and for this kind of blues rock uh, genre, don't you think? It just feels way outside to me. But then when you get to the second verse, it's everything is exactly right. It's, could, it's as opposite as it could be. I believe that you're talking to me. Every word is a light to my feet. All of a sudden, we've got some biblical references in there that, that feel real and authentic. And you lead me to your riverside. Again, biblical. Uh, I would say for your company is just what I need. I would change that last line just a bit. Man, you do that as your opening verse, and you are so into this song. Is verse one usable as verse two then? I think verse one, it, liquid blue just sounds too literary to me. It, it is neither uh, a biblical nor is it conversational. And that seems to be what we're setting up here. To your river I am running. Again, we're looking at a biblical reference. To your river I hear you calling, won't you take me, won't you take me to your river. It's very compelling. So when you get into a phrase that sounds literary, like liquid blue, and glory, glory divine is has the biblical thing in it, but it just feels literary to me. And captivated is another very literary word. I need psychological help. I looked at the chorus and I just thought, wouldn't that chorus be great in um, one of the drugs for, um, uh, what do they call it, when men can't urinate properly? Um, Sorry. No, uh, I cannot help you with um, this. With prostate, you know, prostate really, uh, there are all these commercials for prostate. So where are you so going with this? Where I'm going with it is to your river I am running, to your river I hear you calling, won't you take me, won't you take me to your river I hear you calling. And it's got such an up-tempo, it's almost like some of the Viagra commercials. Oh, and, a Viagra commercial, maybe, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of the Viagra commercials, the guy, you know, the motorcycle. Yeah, the guy on the know. motorcycle, the guy in the truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's possible. But anyway. It, I it think just, it has a lot more uses than that. It could be well, too on I'm the sure nose. I'm sure it does. That, you know? uh, a little just, on the nose for it that, It just Michael. hit me. Uh, um, but I think, and you want to be careful about anything that's too on the nose like that. But the metaphor being um, the irresistible call of the siren is and never uses the word siren which i thought mm -hmm. was interesting is doesn't actually refer to the myth which is good i think that's fine that would be too literary and the river imagery of uh, the biblical river imagery works great for um in songs like uh, indie folk 
uh, Mumford and Sons works great. James Bay certainly mined that image really, really well. And I would think that music libraries would be looking for a song like this. So what I would do is say, uh, flip the two verses and then rewrite that verse and take out the literary liquid blue, the things that are very poetic, that are clearly poetic. Um, it is a more, and go more towards an authentic blues and biblical gospel feel than towards a literary feel uh, with the language. Um, soaring on wings, just don't go there. It just don't do that. So it means that it needs a new verse two. Use verse two as verse one and write a new verse two. The first pre-chorus, the na-na's, seemed to me to come too early in the song. I've, I wanted, I thought, and when you went to them in, the, in what you're calling the tag, and I would call a post hook after the chorus, that section where you went to the oh-ohs and na-na's together, that really worked. I love that. To me, that's where the song really took off. Mm -hmm. So you might consider dropping the pre-chorus out. I, don't, I think you did it both times, but I don't remember. Yes, you did. I would either drop it out or, or better yet, I would write a lyric for it and mm -hmm. just go deeper into this feeling of being compelled to go towards the river, uh, the river of, of love or the river of music or the river of song, the river of, of sexuality, whatever that river represents to you, just give us more of that compelling feeling so that by the time we get to, to your river I am running, we are really feeling what he's feeling and why he is compelled to go there. I didn't think we got quite there. The nanas really were a throwaway section. Uh, leading into that. Can we listen to the last half of the song one more time? Because oh, everybody so reacted to that. And yeah. I, and I want to know why. I mean, you can. Yeah. That's the bad one. It's so tight. It's so good. It's so good. I would. You've seen taxi listings many, many times that say instrumentals, but uh, non-lyrical vocals are okay. I would do an instrumental cut oh, of yeah. the back half of this song, stick a berry sax on the bottom of that thing just to give it a little more gravitas on the bottom end, and just leave those vocals doing the uh oh oh oh. Oh, yeah, that could, could be in a commercial in no time. Absolutely. That thing would get used all yeah, the time. Yeah, this reminds like me crazy. of the song Yeah, Yeah by Willie Moon, and that was an iPod commercial, a big one. And if you heard it, you'd recognize it. Um, it was all over the place. Absolutely. It's really, really hot. I would definitely. There was another song uh, by. Edward Sharp and the, and the Magnetic Zeros. Zeros yeah. um, it was a car commercial, and they just used the instrumental section with the non nonverbal vocals in it. It's a huge car commercial. So, yeah, definitely. The end of that is great. But you want to be sure that you get the song into the hands of a music supervisor and get and catch them from the very beginning. You could pitch just the ending. It's I'm sure you've got a minute or, what, 30 seconds of that, what you just played. Uh, and that would work great. Really yeah, good. Um, Very hot on the ending. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's wrap it up because I have much work to do tonight for the road rally, and you need to get home and rehearse a thousand times. This woman puts so much effort into rehearsing her thing that when you see her on stage, she it's looks, all timed and everything. It, I know. She makes it look like, eh, no big deal, because she's rehearsed it a thousand. She's like Steve frickin' Jobs is what she's like. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> you should only have his bank account. <laughs> anyway, thank you very, very much for tuning in today. Next Monday, we will be doing the Dragging My Butt episode of Taxi <laughs> TV. Uh, we have a guy from somewhere outside of the U.S., I can't remember, Holland or somewhere, that is coming to the road rally, wants to interview me for a magazine or a radio show or something. I said, why don't you interview me on Taxi TV? 
And then we're going to be joined by the lovely and wonderful Lydia Ashton, who is our John Brahaney Award winner this year. Yeah. And she's going to stop by, and I will interview her for those of you who didn't make it to the road rally. But if you're not making it to the road rally, you're making a big mistake, especially you guys who live in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's shocking to me how many members live in Los Angeles and don't get off the couch to come to the best music convention anywhere that's free. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then lays around the couch going, frickin' music industry, I'm not getting anywhere. You know, and you know what? I'm chained yeah. to my uh, book table, uh, which is right there in the main hallway, <laughs> the entire weekend. <laughs> he doesn't let me leave the book table. I just tell, I just have books. And I, and I love talking to people. So um, come by my table. And if you have a question about stuff you want to talk about, I love talking about this It'll stuff. It'll be the one that oh, has yeah. the two very colorful signs. Yeah. Can you can't miss it. Right. looks just like that with her face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting right there. And uh, and I don't get to leave. So from 11 until 4 every day, I'm there. And uh, by, by all means, come by and, and chat with me about songwriting. And if you don't have my books, take a look. I'll have, a, I'll have them there. All right, you guys. Thank you for showing up. Uh, Robin, thank you. Oh, thank for you. For doing your fun. always amazing always. job. And we will see you guys at the rally or next week on another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys.